Thank you. Uh, so first of all, uh, let me just start by thanking the organizers of this Citrus seminar series. Uh, it's always a particularly exciting to give a talk kind of in front of the home crowd, if you know what I mean. Uh, and I also thought it was a, a really great opportunity for me to uh, try and share some information about the molecular foundry, what it is and, and how we operate, and just give you some examples of some scientific projects that were born from my interactions with other scientists on campus and up at LBNL. And it's science that reflects, I think, the unique brand of research that can take place at a, at a place like the Molecular Foundry. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen it yet, uh, this is a photograph of the Foundry as of January 2006, I believe. So it's about a year old. And how many people here have actually been up to the Molecular Foundry, other than the people from my group who I see sitting in the audience? <laughs> Not that many. So a lot of you are missing something, and um, if you're interested in, in taking a look at the Foundry, you know, it's, we, we actually have tours that run virtually every week, and we can certainly um, arrange to get you that information. But you can see it from the freeway. It's uh, the second building that's highly visible from down on I-80, the first, of course, being the ALS. So if you look up, you'll see the Foundry sort of perched in the canyon up at LBNL. It's, it's quite spectacular. Just a little bit about my own history. Um, I was trained as kind of a hybrid between a synthetic organic chemist and a cell biologist. And it's only in the last five years or so that I've become uh, sort of directly involved in nanoscience research. And I have to say that it's hard not to get excited about what's going on in this very rapidly growing field, especially at a place like Berkeley and LBNL where it's kind of an epicenter of nanoscience and nanotechnology. So, this has been, again, a, a very unique environment for me that's had a transforming effect on my own research interests and hopefully will continue to have that kind of an effect on the other people in our local environment and in the community at large. So I, I don't think I have to give a huge introduction to this audience about what's so exciting about nanoscience and nanotechnology. I think we all now are appreciative of the fact that when materials have nanoscale dimensions, they can have very unusual properties that are not reflected at either the larger scale or the smaller scale. And I just borrowed a, a few images, some from Berkeley scientists, others from Google Images. Uh, but you'll recognize some of these pictures. Uh, for example, carbon nanotubes, which are now the subject of study in a number of labs here on campus and up at LBNL. They have quite remarkable optical properties and mechanical properties and conducting properties. Uh, and these are properties that we're interested in for a variety of interesting applications. In fact, just the other night I was, I was watching NOVA and there was a discussion of the space elevator. You know, the concept of sending an elevator up to sort of join up with the various space stations that are orbiting the Earth and that nanotubes might be the only material strong enough to form the cable for such a space elevator. And of course that would place quite a demand on the production of these materials, but sort of fun to think about. Uh, and here's an image, uh, this is from research in Carlos Bustamante's lab, and he's my colleague in MCB and also in chemistry, and I think he's got an appointment in physics as well. And his group is studying what happens uh, in biological systems at the nanometer scale. For example, when viral particles package DNA, how do they get the forces required to stuff so much DNA into such a small space? Uh, and this is a problem that's really a nanoscale problem. And by using techniques such as single molecule apparatus that allows you to pull on things and measure forces, he's gained quite a bit of insight into how these viruses work. So one thing that I think is the most exciting feature to me about the field of nanoscience is that it draws upon so many classical disciplines. So people with backgrounds in physics and chemistry and biology and engineering and of course computer science all have something to contribute to nanoscience. And I think it could be argued that in order to practice nanoscience at you know, the highest level possible, one has to bring in expertise from all of these different backgrounds. Now, those of us who've been around academia for some time know that historically, physics, chemistry, biology, engineering evolved quite separately as disciplines. And in fact, we have separate departments on our campus, which is a vestige of that organization. In fact, if you look around the Berkeley campus, just you know, where the buildings are located, this again gives you a sense of the separateness of these disciplines, at least dating back in history. For example, I have appointments both in chemistry and in molecular and cell biology, and my colleagues from biology couldn't be further away from me physically. They're at the opposite end of campus. 
And so now this seems ridiculous because we'd like to interact more frequently. But there was a time when it really wasn't obvious that people from these different backgrounds really had anything to say to one another. And obviously that's changed and, and for the better. Now, of course, if you can bring together all of these disciplines to bear on nanoscience, uh, then the applications are quite profound. And already we found that nanoscience has produced novel materials with interesting properties that are going to affect uh, many different industries. Um, they've already had quite an impact in biomedicine and in information technology, and we think they're going to have quite a bit to contribute to energy. Of course, this is a major problem that is mobilizing scientists from all the different disciplines to start thinking about. And most of you are probably aware of the fact that BP will be making a very big investment in the local Berkeley environment to develop alternative sources of energy other than, or as they would say, beyond petroleum. So <clears throat> it's with all of that in mind uh, that the Molecular Foundry was born. So many people ask me, what is the Molecular Foundry? And we are a user facility. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with LBNL and with the Department of Energy, uh, there is a history of the DOE building large-scale user facilities that are available to the community of scientists around the world. The ones that are the best known are probably the neutron sources and the synchrotrons. So for example, up at LBNL, we have the advanced light source, the ALS. And you probably know that people from around the world will fly to Berkeley to spend time on the ALS because it's a synchrotron. Well, I think it's the brightest synchrotron, at least in the United States. And it also has soft x-rays and it has capabilities that you wouldn't find anywhere else. Well, likewise, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, um, some people in basic energy sciences at the Department of Energy realized that the field of nanoscience could also benefit from having state-of-the-art instrumentation and experts available as a user facility. And that's what the Molecular Foundry is. So we actually have a dual mission. On the one hand, we are a facility that provides state-of-the-art instrumentation and expertise in nanoscience for the community at large. What that means in practice is that if you want to make a nanomaterial or you want to characterize a nanomaterial in some high-tech way that you don't have locally in your institution, or if you want to perform a theoretical analysis of nanomaterials and you don't have the expertise for that kind of calculation, what you can do is bring that problem to the Molecular Foundry, work together with the scientists at the Molecular Foundry who do have expertise and who do have the instrumentation, and get that problem solved. So we have a lot of visiting scientists. We have space, we have cubicles and lab space for those people to take up residence in the foundry for a day, a week, a month, a year, maybe even longer depending on the needs of the project. And we have plenty of people who use the molecular foundry without ever setting foot in the door. So we might be able to make an unusual nanomaterial that requires specific expertise or in-house knowledge. And other people in the world might want access to that material. So they can apply to use the foundry in that they just request that material. And we'll make it for them and we'll send it to them. Or they might have a material or a chip or something that they've engineered and they would like us to characterize it for them. They can just ship it to us and we'll perform the STM or the AFM or whatever needs to be done. So we do have a lot of off-site users, in fact, more so than we have on-site users. And this distinguishes the Molecular Foundry from some other user facilities like the ALS for which most of the users actually do come and spend time at the facility. Now, while all of that is going on, um, we also have the mission of being a research institute, which means that we want to push forward the frontiers of nanoscience with our own internal research effort. So the staff scientists who make up the majority of scientists at the foundry, they're PhD level scientists, have their own internal research projects that are running in parallel with their user activities. And they roughly split their time 50-50. So half the time they're doing their own research, often in a highly collaborative way with other scientists in the foundry. And the other half of their time, they're working with users, they're helping people do experiments, and it's just a very collaborative, interactive environment. It's a lot of fun to come and spend time with these people. We've hired some very smart uh, people. I think our head count right now is about 40 total staff members, and this includes PhD level, technical staff, so BS, MS level scientists, various IT and administrative staff, and we're still hiring another 20 scientists or so. So if you're just about to hit the job market, 
Okay, take a look at our website because we have a lot of jobs posted in all different areas of nanoscience, at computation, you know, chemistry, physics, engineering, nanofabrication, you name it. So just so you know, uh, we are not the only nanoscience user facility. And in fact, at the time that the Molecular Foundry was funded, the Department of Energy also funded four additional what we call NSRCs. So these are the Nanoscale Science Research Centers. And we are all located uh, right together with a national lab. And these are other national labs that also have like uh, synchrotrons or neutron sources. They tend to have partner their user facilities. So if the capability that you're looking for does not exist at the molecular foundry out here at LBNL, uh, you might be able to find that fancy instrument or that expert person at one of the other facilities. And we all have our own unique brand of expertise and our unique focus in nanoscience, although there's some overlap as well. And we all have websites, and we're easy to find on the web. Okay. So the Molecular Foundry is a six-story building, and each floor of the building is what we call a facility with a specific technical expertise. And these are the six facilities. So for example, just from the top down, the very top floor is the organic and macromolecular synthesis facility. And this is a lab that's outfitted to synthesize polymers, dendromers, nanoparticles that are made of carbon-based substances. Okay? So it kind of looks like an organic chemistry lab. Then the fifth floor is the biological nanostructures facility. And this floor is kind of a hybrid of a chemistry lab and a biology lab. But we have the facilities in that floor for cell culture, for molecular biology, protein expression, and also for synthesis of biological molecules like proteins, nucleic acids, and so on. Then the fourth floor is the inorganic nanostructures floor. And on this floor, they have the capability to synthesize nanoparticles, like quantum dots, nanowires, including carbon nanotubes. They have chemical vapor deposition instrumentation. They have lots of glove boxes for air-sensitive reagents. And they do a lot of synthesis. The third floor is our theory floor. And as you can imagine, there's just a lot of cubicles and a lot of computers on that floor. We have a big cluster, but it's actually housed uh, at the NERSC, which is the National Energy Research Supercomputing Center, another user facility up at LBNL. The second floor is the nanofabrication facility, and so we have a big clean room. And, and it's not just your run-of-the-mill ultra clean room, we also have what they call a dirty clean room. So it's a clean room where one can use biological samples and volatile organic materials, and we think that's going to be very important for the practice of nanoscience. Then finally, the first floor, which is our most vibrationally insulated floor, has um, ultra high resolution imaging and manipulation techniques. So we have a lot of scanning probe techniques down there, including atomic force microscopes uh, that we have built in-house to have resolution of single water molecules. It's pretty amazing stuff. Um, so again, anything you're looking for in the area of nanoscience, whether it's synthesis, characterization, or theoretical analysis, chances are you'll find the gadgetry and the smart people at the foundry that can help you do that research. Okay, So with that uh, brief overview of what is the Molecular Foundry, um, I thought what I could do is just give you examples of three research projects uh, from my laboratory that are highly collaborative projects with other scientists involved in the foundry. And in large part, uh, these problems were brought to us by nanoscientists who thought that we as biologists and chemists could have something to offer to the problem. And those three projects are first, interfacing carbon nanotubes with cells, and then second, inserting nanoparticles into cells, and finally, addressing cells on synthetic surfaces. Okay, so starting with the carbon nanotubes. Um, I already mentioned before that carbon nanotubes have some remarkable properties. Um, they have posed very interesting challenges from the point of view of synthesis, manipulation, and also theoretical analysis. And biologists are now starting to get very excited about what carbon nanotubes might do for them. For example, carbon nanotubes might be used as sensors of analytes produced by cells. Or they might be used as probes to image cells, or even as drug delivery particles that can take materials and, and deliver them specifically to cells. And all of these applications will require that the carbon nanotube can be manipulated together with the cell in the same system. But there turn out to be some pretty important problems that have gotten in the way 
of taking carbon nanotubes into cellular systems. Not the least of which is that carbon nanotubes, uh, first of all, have very poor solubility in water. But even a bigger problem than that is that they tend to be toxic. So if you co-culture cells together with carbon nanotubes, generally the cells will die. Now, unfortunately, the mechanism of toxicity of the carbon nanotubes is not very well understood. Uh, some theories suggest that the carbon nanotubes have high surface energy. They're capable of engaging in oxidation chemistry, and the oxidation chemistry can damage cells. Other people think it might have to do with their shape, that when they come into contact with cells, the cells try and eat them, and they have these very long needle-like shapes, which can be then physically damaging to the cells as the cells are trying to engulf the tubes, and then that could kill the cell. We don't really know. But it suffices to say that the carbon nanotubes are toxic to cells. And if you're going to use them in the context of a cellular experiment, you have to figure out how to overcome that toxicity problem. So this problem was brought to us by Alex Zettel's group and various other groups on campus that were interested in applications of carbon nanotubes. And the challenge they put before us was, as a biologist, can you figure out how to convert a carbon nanotube from a toxic substance to a biofriendly substance? So what we did is we said, all right, let's look at the surface of the carbon nanotube, which looks very different from the surface of a cell, and see if we can't do chemistry on the carbon nanotube to make it look more like the cell. So first, of course, one has to wonder, what does the cell look like? Well, this is something we actually know quite a bit about, and brings us back to that wonderful term, glycoslimation. Okay? Um, the more technical term would be glycosylation. What that means is coated, coated with sugars. So the surface of cells is basically coated with sugars. And what I'm showing you here is a cartoon that illustrates the plasma membrane. It's a lipid bilayer. And if you've taken any sort of introductory biology course, you probably saw cartoons like this. Well, on the surface of human cells, um, that lipid bilayer uh, is coated with a family of molecules called mucin glycoproteins. Glyco is a Latin prefix that means sugar. So glycoprotein is a protein that has sugars attached to it. And these proteins uh, generally have hydrophobic domains that span the plasma membrane of the cell. And then the part of the protein that's decorated with sugars projects to the outside of the cell. So basically, your cell surfaces have glycoproteins, and they're basically coated with sugars. Now, this term mucin, mucin is a polite term for the more common term of mucus. And mucus, that's the glycoslimation thing, OK? Yeah, mucus, of course, is a lubricative material that coats all of your epithelial tissues, like your nasal passages, your lung tissue, uh, the surface of your eyes, your cornea. They're all coated with mucus. The reason that mucus has its lubricative properties has to do with the actual structures of the sugars that are attached to those mucin glycoproteins. And I'm showing you the chemical structure of a prototypical sugar that you'd find on these mucin glycoproteins. The most important element is this blue part, which goes by the abbreviation GALMAC. That's a little name we give to the simple sugar in the field of carbohydrate or, or glycochemistry. Now, there's something special about the structure of these mucin glycoproteins that differentiates them from every other protein in your body. It turns out that these complicated sugar molecules are bunched together in clusters, uh, where each of these balls is another one of these sugars. They're so close together that they force the backbone of the protein into this rigid, extended structure. So that's why I draw this like a line. And the molecule literally looks like a hairbrush. So because these things are packed together and the protein is forced into this rigid, extended structure, these mucin glycoproteins tend to be very tall. They're like the giant redwood trees on the surface of the cell. They tower above the cell surface, and they basically provide a protective coating for the surface of your cell. In fact, in biology, the mucin glycoproteins seem to have two functions that are kind of paradoxical. So on the one hand, so here's cartoons of mucins. Uh, these mucin glycoproteins are so tall that every other what I'll call vanilla protein on the plasma membrane is sort of buried in the shadow, kind of overshadowed by these giant redwoods. And so if this cell were to come into contact with, let's say, another cell, even if that other cell had a protein that might want to bind this protein where the two cells would then stick together, if that cell is coated with these mucins, it's basically a passivator, and it prevents the two cells from interacting. So for those of you who are familiar with material science, 
You've probably heard of polyethylene glycol, or PEG. And pegylation is what material scientists often use to passivate the surface of silicon or some implant material to prevent anything from sticking to it. Well, in nature, it's the mucins that passivate the surface of cells and prevent things from sticking. Yet paradoxically, and at the same time, mucins can have some very specific sugar structures that will bind non-covalently to receptors on another cell. So the fact that they're towering way above the cell surface can be advantageous in that that can present a ligand in a very exposed fashion to another cell and allow cells to interact if that is what should be happening. So mucins can not only passivate cells from unwanted interactions, but they can promote the wanted interactions. And they do both in nature. So in thinking about this system in nature, of course, it occurred to us that if we could put mucins on the surface of carbon nanotubes, not only could we passivate the nanotubes in a biological system, but we might also be able to engineer specific interactions between a carbon nanotube and a cell. And that might be useful for the biologists. So we started thinking about the chemical structure of these mucin glycoproteins and how to synthesize something comparable that could be mounted onto a carbon nanotube. So here's the actual chemical structure focusing on the region where the sugar and the protein are linked. So this is what you find in nature. And that very first sugar I showed before called Galnac turns out to be pretty important for the overall conformation of these glycoproteins. So the features of mucin that are important for its physical properties are the dense, gly dense glycosylation, so the sort of clusters of these sugars, certain molecular weight, and the fact that the backbone is rigidified, which makes them very tall so that they can passivate. Now, in the perfect world, we could synthesize molecules that look just like biological mucin and put those on carbon nanotubes. But in the real world that we live in, these molecules are incredibly hard to make. And I won't go through the reasons, but there are some bonds within these molecules that chemists w just don't want to have to deal with. Okay? It would take one student five years just to make a little fragment like this. So Gusu Lee, who's a former postdoc in my lab, and Dave Rabuka, who's a graduate student, came up with an idea for a, a synthetic mimic of mucin that would be much easier to synthesize and hopefully have many of the same properties, at least the important properties for passivation. And this is the structure of their mucin mimic. So what they did is they dispensed with a polypeptide backbone and replaced it with a very simple polyalkyl chain. And this is a kind of polymer backbone that you can make by radical polymerization of very simple, inexpensive starting materials. It's a kind of polymer that's used widely in the biomaterials industry. Then they worked out some chemistry to link the sugars, and these are the same exact kinds of sugars that you find in the natural mucins, to the polymer backbone using a kind of bond that's known as an oxime. And oximes are very, very easy bonds to make for chemists, unlike all the bonds you find over here, which are very hard bonds to make. Now, in the forward sense of their synthesis, this is how it takes place. They start with very inexpensive monomers, like this compound, which is called methyl vinyl ketone. We abbreviate that MVK. And they do a polymerization reaction so that MVK makes a very long chain polymer. The important functional group in MVK is the ketone. And it's the ketone that we use as part of the oxime bond forming reaction. We can also make polymers in which we mix together MVK with another monomer that has a water solubilizing group. And this polymer, which is a copolymer of MVK and this thing called DAPA, uh, tends to be more soluble in water. It's a little easier to work with than poly MVK. And then we can make related polymers in which there's just one additional methyl group. So you see there's a methyl group here and here. These are branches that are not found on these other polymers. So this is a polymer between something called IMK and DAPA looks very similar to this polymer, except for that extra methylation. And I'll tell you that what that methylation does is to add further rigidity to the polymer backbone, because it sort of impedes free rotation around the various carbon-carbon bonds. So once these polymers are in place, we can simply mix them together with sugars, which are what these colored balls are meant to reflect. And those sugars have a functional group called the amino oxy group. When this and this get together, they form the oxime, and we can basically self-assemble these sugar-coated polymers. We just mix the polymer together with the sugar, and we get a variety of different mucin mimics, as we call them. So now, with the ability to synthesize these molecules, one of the first questions we asked are, how similar are they to actual biological mucin glycoproteins? 
And again, the most important feature we were trying to mimic was the rigidity of the backbone, because we know that's important for passivation. So an experiment we did was to take the polymers before and after the sugars were ligated to them, and then ask the question, how does the overall length of the polymer change? If the polymer gets much longer, which is the model that we're following, then we have some confidence that the backbone has been rigidified. So how do we determine if the polymer does go from sort of more globular to more rigidified? Well, we can measure a parameter that's called the radius of hydration, which is basically the volume that these polymers occupy. And that value can be obtained using a gel permeation chromatography instrument, or GPC, kind of a standard instrument used by polymer chemists. So in our model, before the sugars are attached, the polymer should just be kind of a random globule. It should have a relatively small radius of hydration. But after the sugars are added to the polymer backbone and it's fully decorated with sugars, if it is rigidified, we would expect a much larger radius of hydration. So we can measure these numbers, and here are some data. Um, and what you should focus on are just this column and this column. So these are the radii of hydration in nanometers of various polymers before the sugars are added. And the polymer structures are shown down here. And you can see they're all around 2 nanometers for this particular batch of polymers, which have various molecular weights that we determined by mass spectrometry. But after we add the sugars, their radii of, uh, uh, radii of hydration increase dramatically. So from 2 nanometers out to 30 or 40, all the way even up to 65 nanometers. And just as a point of reference, we did a back of the envelope calculation where we took the known molecular weight of the polymers based on mass spec so that we knew how many monomers were in each polymer. And then we calculated the theoretical radius of hydration in the fully extended conformation. And you can see that in the bottom case, which is the copolymer of IMK and DAPA, after the sugars are attached, the radius of hydration is not far off from the theoretical value you would expect from a fully extended, totally rigid polymer. So this was exciting because it suggests that we have made polymers that have sugars on them that look very much like biological mucins. Now, in nature, the mucin glycoproteins are attached to the plasma membrane of a cell by virtue of a hydrophobic transmembrane domain. That's how they're anchored. And likewise, we want our mucin polymers to attach to the surface of a carbon nanotube and then extend upward into the surrounding solution. So that means we have to introduce a hydrophobic anchor at one end of the polymers so that it can attach itself to the hydrophobic surface of a carbon nanotube, which is basically like the surface of graphite. So basically, in cartoon form, we need a synthesis in which we can put a tail on that mucin mimic so that that tail will attach to the carbon nanotube, the mucin polymers will project from the surface, and that the overall picture will look, hopefully, something like the surface of a cell. That's the objective. So here's a lot of gory synthetic chemistry, and I won't bore you with the details, but it suffices to say that Dave Rabuka was able to work out some chemistry in which he can basically build the ketone polymers off of a lipid tail. And the lipid tail can be virtually any structure you want. So it can be a very long chain hydrocarbon. It can be a cholesterol group. It could be a pyrene moiety. And this is an interesting group because it's known that pyrenes will adsorb to the surface of carbon nanotubes in water very tightly by pi stacking and aromatic interactions. So the chemistry uh, was not too hard to work out. Now, Ching Chen, who's another student in my lab, and he works jointly with Alex Zettel's lab in physics, um, developed a procedure for loading these hydrophobic tailed mucin mimics onto the surface of the nanotubes. He simply would take a bundle of carbon nanotubes in water with a solution of these lipid tail polymers and just sonicate for an hour. And under those conditions, the bundles would break apart, and the hydrophobic tails would adsorb on the surface of the nanotubes, bringing them into solution. He would then do a centrifugation to pellet out any of the nanotubes that had not been decorated with the mucin mimics. And that would then provide a solution of solubilized, decorated nanotubes plus some unbound polymers, mimic, mucin mimics. So a dialysis then gets rid of these unbound polymers, leaving simply a nice pure sample of the carbon nanotubes that are decorated with the mucin mimics. And you can see what this looks like. Um, so vial A and vial C are either single-wall or multi-walled carbon nanotubes that are decorated with the mucin mimics. And they form these very nice, stable suspensions or solutions, depending on how you define it, where after months and months of sitting on the benchtop, we never see any precipitate. So very stable 
situation. By contrast, if you take unmodified carbon nanotubes, uh, either single wall or multi wall, and put them in an aqueous solution, they just clump up into these bundles and fall right to the bottom. They're just not soluble at all. Okay? But these are very nicely solubilized. And we can image them and take a look at what this coating is all about. Uh, so these are TEM images of carbon nanotubes that are decorated with the mucin mimics. And you can see the slime, you know, they really are coated with mucus, basically. Uh, and if you measure the thickness of that mucin coating, it very nicely matches the radius of hydration that we had measured for this particular uh, mucin prep. Okay. So now that we had the mucin mimics on the surface of the carbon nanotubes, the next question was, can we take those modified tubes and interface them with biological systems? And we started by simply asking the question if we could bind them specifically to proteins in solution. Now, there is a protein that we work with that goes by the abbreviation of HPA, and it just so happens that that protein binds to the sugar Galnac, and it's in an alpha conformation. So it's a specific form of Galnac, which is the sugar we have on our mucins. So can this protein bind to Galnac when those mucins are coating the nanotubes? Well, the way we assay that is we put a fluorescent probe, fluorescence is called FITSI, it's a fluorescein derivative, onto that protein, then we incubate the protein with the modified nanotubes and then ask if the nanotubes become fluorescent. And in fact, they do, and you can tell by doing basically fluorescent spectroscopy. Okay, by contrast, if in the same experiment you add a soluble form of Galnac, well, what happens is this sugar binds to the protein and blocks the site that would otherwise bind to the Galnac on our coated tubes. And that prevents the protein from binding to the tubes, and now the carbon nanotubes are essentially non-fluorescent. Likewise, if we take the carbon nanotubes and we put a slightly different structured sugar on the mucins, and this is a beta form of Galnac, it's a different stereoisomer, that form does not bind to the protein HBA. And likewise, if we take the protein and incubate it with the tubes, there's essentially no fluorescence. So the bottom line from these experiments is that when we have the mucins on the carbon nanotubes, what we can do is specifically bind the protein that binds Galnac. If the protein doesn't bind Galnac, it won't stick to the surface of the nanotube. So the nanotubes are passivated against irrelevant proteins and yet able to bind to relevant proteins that have the right specificity. But what about cells? Because remember at the outset, the goal here was to modify these carbon nanotubes so that they would look more like a cell, that they would be passivated so that their surface wouldn't contact the cell, and that therefore they'd be biocompatible. So we asked the question, if you take these carbon nanotubes and interact them with cells in a specific fashion, are they toxic? So we take advantage of that protein HPA for this experiment uh, because it turns out HPA is hexavalent. It's got six binding sites for Galnac. So what we can do is take that protein, which is shown in purple here, and use some of those sites to bind to the carbon nanotubes that have the mucin mimics, whereas other sites are binding to Galnac residues on the surface of the cell. So basically, the HPA is a glue that attaches the carbon nanotube to the cell surface. And now the question is, how do the cells feel about that? Okay? So we do a toxicity study, which means that as a function of time, we look at how many cells survive in the culture dish in the presence of variously modified nanotubes. And the cells that we used in this particular experiment are the Chinese hamster ovary cells. That might seem kind of arbitrary. To why the Chinese hamster? Why, why not the something else hamster? And why the ovary? Okay. Well, it turns out that these are just a very commonly used cell line in the world of cell biology. They're very well characterized. We understand them. They're easy to work with. Okay. So if you incubate these cells with unmodified carbon nanotubes as a function of time, the cells do not grow. That's what the flat line means. In other words, they're, they're sick. They can't divide. And we knew that from the literature. However, if we treat them with carbon nanotubes that have been coated with the mucins, the cells grow just fine. And what's hard to see here is that one of these curves is actually cells growing in the absence of any carbon nanotubes of any type. So in other words, as long as the carbon nanotubes are coated with the mucins, they're protected, basically the cells are protected from their harmful toxic effects. So this is very interesting and sort of begs the question again, what is the mechanism of toxicity and why do the mucins, why does the coating actually prevent this toxicity? So this is something we're looking into and we hope to kind of get a biologist's handle on that problem. Okay, So that's interfacing carbon nanotubes with cells. 
Uh, now, in the last five or ten minutes, I'm going to very quickly tell you about these two projects, and they are quick stories, starting with inserting nanoparticles into cells. So as we were doing this research um, and playing around with carbon nanotubes, uh, we had people from the foundry come to us and say, well, you know, we're interested in nanoparticles and the use of nanoparticles in biology. And in fact, nanoparticles have become the darling of the cell imaging community. For those of you who aren't familiar with them, they have fabulous luminescence properties. They're very bright fluorescent dyes. And unlike organic dyes, these quantum dots or nanoparticles, they don't bleach which means you can irradiate them for a long period of time and kind of follow them around in cells. So they're very popular. Um, not only that, you can conjugate nanoparticles to proteins like antibodies and actually target them to specific proteins on a cell and follow those proteins around. So they've, they've become very powerfully used by cell biologists. But they're not perfect. And the major problem is this, that these nanoparticles or quantum dots do not penetrate cell membranes. So they're really only useful if you want to image a protein that's on the surface of a cell, which is what's shown here. But if you want to target some system that's interior to the cell, there's no way, simply put, to get that nanoparticle to the intracellular protein. Okay, so now, biologists have techniques that they can use to overcome problems of this type. And the most commonly used is what's called cell microinjection. So what that means literally is you take a micropipette, sort of a micron scale needle, and you literally just poke a hole physically in the membrane of the cell and just inject that stuff into the cell. And people have done this with quantum dots, in fact. The problem is, and you can kind of get a sense from these images, so here's, this is a commercial rig for microinjection. There's just little micro manipulators and you basically just take a pipette and just ram it into the cell. And here's a picture of that happening. Uh, and you get a sense, look at the size of the needle versus the size of the cell. Okay? The hole you're puncturing the cell with is on the order of a micron. The cell itself might only be 10 microns in diameter. Okay? So you can imagine on that scale, a one micron hole is a pretty significant perturbation. And some cells simply will not tolerate that kind of an insult. Now, of course, as a nanoscientist, the obvious solution to that problem is shrink the size of the needle, right? From the micron scale to the nanoscale. And Ching Chen, who's the student who works jointly between myself and Alex Settle, realized that a carbon nanotube might be the perfect nano injector, right? A nano needle. So he came up with this idea. There's a little movie here that our, an undergraduate made for us. See, this is an AFM tip. And loaded on the end of it, oh, I hope you can see this, is a carbon nanotube. The lights are too bright. And we thought we would just use the AFM tip to push the nanotube into a cell and release somehow some quantum dots inside the cell. And the idea is that the hole that that nano, you want to see that again? Since you're videotaping this. Okay, ready? Here we go. One more time. There it is. AFM tip. The lights are a little bright, so you can't really see that there is a picture of a carbon nanotube right there loaded with quantum dots. We're going to push that needle into the cell, right through the membrane. The hole is so small that the cell, hopefully, wouldn't even notice. And then the quantum dots are released inside the cell where they can then be delivered to whatever you're targeting them to. Okay? So now, how do you do this? Um, well, here is the idea that Ching came up with. He said, okay, let's take the carbon nanotube. We already know that these can be loaded on AFM tips. That was already reported. And what we'll do is we'll coat the carbon nanotubes with quantum dots using a linker molecule with a disulfide bond. And I'll show you why that's important in a minute. In order to get this molecule onto the nanotube, he has pyrene on one end, which adsorbs to carbon nanotubes, and then biotin on the other. And that's a small molecule that binds to a protein called streptavidin with very high affinity. And it turns out you can purchase quantum dots that are coated with streptavidin from commercial sources. So he made the molecule, he incubated it with the dots and with the carbon nanotube, all on an AFM tip, and this is what it looks like in real life. Here's the AFM tip, here's the nanotube, blown up. You can see the carbon nanotube and all these little dots, these are quantum dots, okay, that are bound via all of that stuff. So here's the idea. What we would do is use the AFM to position the nanotube above the target cell. We'd push the tube through the membrane. Turns out that the interior of a cell is relatively reducing compared to the exterior. And disulfide bonds get reduced inside cells by glutathione, which is a thiol inside the cell. So that's the release mechanism that will shed the quantum dot, set it free, and then we just retract the needle. Okay? So here are some actual images of cells that have been nano-injected using this apparatus. So what you're looking at here is the same field 
imaged by bright field microscopy, and you can see the cells, these outlines here, and, and fluorescence microscopy. And this is before the nano injection, and here's the AFM tip kind of shadowing the image. And what Ching did is he picked a cell, shown with the arrow, then he positioned the AFM tip over that cell and did the nano injection. And now here's fluorescence micro, uh, the micrograph and the bright field micrograph overlaid with fluorescence after the injection. And you can see a bunch of quantum dots were released in that cell. And he can actually now do video microscopy and follow these dots around and see where they go. One can take the same tip and nano-inject cells in series. So here's a cell that was nano-injected, followed by that one, followed by this one, followed by this one, because there's plenty of quantum dots on those carbon nanotubes that we can release here and there. Uh, and then we started wondering, well, how do we know that disulfide reduction is, in fact, the release mechanism? I mean, how do we know that you know, this disulfide, you know, this is happening? Could it also be the case that when you push the carbon nanotube through the membrane, that the shear is just stripping these quantum dots off the surface of the nanotube. They're not covalently attached. Well, Ching did a control experiment to address that possible criticism by simply making a linker molecule that lacks a disulfide bond here, but still has the pyrene and everything else. So there's no disulfide reduction possible. And now the question is, do the dots come off the tubes under these circumstances? Okay, and here's the tube. It looks just like the other tube. Well, no, they don't. So here's a before and after picture where a target cell was nano-injected, and he could hold that needle in there for 30 minutes, an hour. We never see any quantum dots released if there's no disulfide bond to release them. So we're pretty confident that the mechanism we designed into the system is, in fact, at play in the nano-injection process. So with that technology available, now we're hoping that the community of biologists can take advantage of it and bring their problem to the molecular foundry and let us solve it by nano-injection. Then finally, just in a few minutes, I'll tell you about addressing cells on synthetic surfaces. Because as we were doing these nano-injection projects, the cell biologists were telling us, well, you know, not only do we need a mechanism to inject things into cells, but it would be nice to have technologies that allow you to position cells on chips in a spatially addressable way. So we started working on that problem. Just a little background, it turns out that most cells in your body are able to attach to extracellular matrix by virtue of receptor ligand interactions. But those interactions tend to be very heterogeneous in that any given cell type can have multiple receptors and there might be multiple ligands and it's hard to control all of this at the chemical scale. So we asked the question, can we come up with a different way of engineering the attachment of a cell to a material using chemically defined interactions rather than the kinds of interactions that nature would normally use? And we started thinking about DNA. Now, we all know that double-stranded DNA uh, is made up of two individual strands that have complementarity by virtue of base pairing. So there's A, T, C, and G, and C and G will pair opposite each other, and A and T will pair. So people have used DNA in all kinds of ways to spatially address molecules on surfaces. And you know that if you take synthetic single-stranded DNA and put it on a surface, that the complementary DNA strand will find it, hybridize, and form the double helix in solution. Okay, that's just a well-known process. So we thought maybe we can take advantage of the sort of molecular glue capacity of DNA to stick cells on surfaces in a spatially addressable fashion. So very simple in cartoon form, we thought we'll just take cells, we'll put synthetic DNA on the surface of the cell. Again, you can have different sequences of DNA on different cells. And then in parallel, we'll take a surface and modify it in a spatially addressed fashion with complementary DNAs. And this technology is well established from the genomics industry. And if you now just mix the cells together with the surface, the cells should sort themselves out based on DNA complementarity. So the green cells that have a particular DNA sequence will find their complement. The yellow cells which have a different sequence will find their complement, and so on and so forth. And this could be a very simple way of putting cells on surfaces. Now, in practice, how we do it is to use some sort of fancy metabolic engineering. And I won't go through the details. But it suffices to say that we can exploit the sugars, once again, on the surface of the cell. So all cells have a sugar called sialic acid. And that sialic acid comes from a precursor called N-acetylmonosamine. So you can feed cells this sugar, and the cells convert it to this one, and that sugar ends up on the surface. What we do is we make analogs of that metabolic precursor where we put a functional group called an azide. And that's not normally present in any of the sugars on your cells. But it's a small enough perturbation that that sugar gets metabolized by the cells to the corresponding sialic acid, and the azide comes along for the ride. 
What the azide offers is now a chemical handle to which we can attach synthetic DNA. And we developed a reaction with this other group called a phosphine so that the phosphine and the azide react and form an amide bond. At the end of the day, this just basically puts DNA on the surface of the cell. So here's a more genericized cartoon of the experiment. Here's the membrane of a cell. We take the cell, we feed it that simple sugar. The sugar goes through the metabolic system, ends up on the surface in these uh, cell surface sugars. We then come along with synthetic DNA. Okay? The synthetic DNA finds that reactive group, and now the DNA is on the surface of the cell. And now we just take the DNA-coded cell and incubate it with a surface that has complementary DNA, and hopefully the double helix forms, which anchors the cell onto the surface. All right. So here's an actual picture of a cell microarray that we generated using DNA-based cell adhesion. What we did is we used a microprinting device to print single-stranded DNA onto the surface of a glass slide. And then we incubated that slide with cells that had been decorated with complementary DNA. And the cells, and these again are Chinese hamster ovary cells, they basically stick only in the spots where we had printed the DNA. So here's you know, basically the same field shown at two different magnifications. And you can see little dots. These are all little cells that are attached to a circle of DNA that we printed. What's interesting is that you can incubate these cells now overnight or for several days and sort of let them grow and divide and sort of take on their normal properties. And what they will eventually do is figure out how to attach to that glass surface using their own biological adhesion receptors after they've deposited their own ligands onto the surface of the glass slide. So basically, they become totally normal cells attached to the glass using their own mechanisms. But the pattern that you see was templated using the DNA-based adhesion. Okay? Importantly, the cells seem to be totally healthy during all of this process. Now, in this cartoon, I showed an example where we had multiple cells sorting at multiple different sites. And we thought we would try an experiment like that. So the student who's working on this, whose name is Ravi uh, Chandra, showed that what he could do is take two different types of cells. These are HeLa cells and JerkCat cells. There's two different types of human cell cancer cells. He put different DNA strands on the two cells. Then he printed a surface with different complementary strands and showed that the JerkCat cells would stick to the right patches and the HeLa cells would stick to other patches. And you could basically position the two different cell types in spatially defined regions. Now this is cool because it means we might be able to build up multicellular arrays that in many ways reflect the kinds of arrays you find in the human body in the form of organized tissues that are made of multiple cell types. And again, you can grow these cells on the arrays for several days, and they'll basically retain the original pattern, uh, but they'll just divide and form colonies. Um, here's the obligatory slide where you write out Cal using your technology of interest. <laughs> and in this case, we basically wrote with DNA Cal, and then we just overlaid it with cells. So we can write with cells on surfaces. Thank you, Ravi, for that picture. OK. So um, basically, that's the end of the talk. And with that, I hope what I've done is, is given you a flavor for the kind of science that goes on at the molecular foundry and what happens when a biologist and a synthetic chemist like me starts hanging around with physicists and material scientists and engineers and computer scientists and so on. And there's obviously a lot of fun to be had. And hopefully, people here will take advantage of the foundry in the same way that we have. So uh, most importantly, I'll thank all the people whose work I mentioned. Um, this is the team that did all the mucin-coated carbon nanotube work. And that was a very close collaboration with Alex Zettel's group in the physics department. And then these two students were responsible for printing cells on surfaces. And that was a very close collaboration with Matt Francis, who's my colleague in chemistry, and Rich Matthews, who's also in chemistry. All of this is funded by the DOE. Thank you very much for your attention. And we have time for a few questions. Thank you so very much. This is a great lecture. Is it on or not? I think it's off. Yeah. Oh, it is on. Oh, on now. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I have a friend, a doctor, who's looking into monitoring electrical signals actually coming out of neural tissue in bone marrow. It's a complicated experiment. Oh. And I'm looking at some of your techniques. Do you see a world where maybe in the near future you could use carbon nanotubes as like an electrical probe without harming the tissue but actually measuring electrical processes in the, in the tissue? I'll tell you. Um, so the question is, can, can, could carbon nanotubes be used as electrical probes? Yeah. You know, as, so I'd say, you know, if you put a bunch of smart Berkeley grad students on a problem, <laughs> give them enough time, they'll probably figure out how to solve it. So I'd say, you know, I'd have to guess yes. Um, the challenge there is that, you know, carbon nanotubes come in multiple flavors, and it depends on their chirality. So they can be semiconducting or metallic and so on. And so one of the challenges that we're working with now is, how do you 
get the right type of carbon, single carbon nanotube onto the tip of whatever probe you're using to manipulate it so that you have a sense of its electrical conducting properties. And that, that is a challenge. But sure. there are, people are thinking of ways of overcoming that. And could, yeah. could retrofinyl actually be processed through that leakage layer that you're synthesizing to measure those five degrees? Is that another limitation? Uh, it depends on what you're monitoring. You know, if, if, if you're electric, if you're, I would say if you're just measuring electrical potential, there might be a problem. But if you've tuned the carbon nanotube to detect a specific analyte in some way, you know, then I'd say yes, something that's freely diffusing. Yeah. Come to the foundry, let's give it a go. Okay. So, Carolyn, these are beautiful examples of nano applied to bio. Uh, but another interesting uh, collaboration is, is bio applied to nano. So, hijacking the machinery of life to make stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how do we get biologists interested in that? Because they're rewarded by their peers in the field for the elucidation of biological systems, not necessarily using uh, biomolecules or bio inspiration uh, for making uh, complex functional systems. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so just as a little backdrop there, over the last, you know, 10 years or so, I know it's been the experience of both myself and other people at LBNL that it's been easy for them to come down to campus and convince a bunch of chemists to start making nanomaterials, okay? It's been harder for them to convince a bunch of faculty from molecular and cell biology to start making nanomaterials using recombinant methods and so on for exactly the reason that you pointed out, which is that the biological funding structure through the National Institutes of Health has been focused more on hypothesis-driven, exploratory, basic science. Uh, and most of the biologists on our campus have been trained in that vein and have a portfolio of funding that requires them to focus in that direction. Okay? So for example, they study transcription. That's what they do. Um, so so how, do you, you know, how do you get biologists to sort of you know, join the party, I guess? Uh, of course, funding is often inspirational. So, um, you know, I think through the Molecular Foundry and other Department of Energy programs, there now are funding opportunities for biologists who want to use their skills in molecular biology and protein expression and protein assembly and x-ray crystallography to build nanomaterials from biological building blocks, okay? So, so the question now is, you know, the money, I think, you know, you can find sources of funding for that kind of bio-nano synthesis, um, and, and now you need people who are going to be inspired to, to go that way. I should point out that at the foundry, um, again, we're a user facility, right? So people from outside the Berkeley environment will come there and do projects. And in the biological nanostructures facility of the foundry, we have users who are doing exactly this, who are coming from a biological background. And one of them, I don't know if he's here, I don't see him. But anyways, one of them, his name is Joseph Mougeot, and he's a postdoc at Harvard Medical School in a microbiology lab. And his advisor studies the pathogenesis of, of Pseudomonas. It has nothing to do with nanoscience, okay? But he uh, found a protein in that bacterium that's secreted in the lungs of infected cystic fibrosis patients. And again, that protein has nothing to do with nanoscience. But he noticed when he solved the crystal structure that in the crystal lattice it looked like a tube. And Joseph happened to be a grad student in my lab. Okay? So he was sort of sensitized to, oh, that looks like a nanotube. I wonder if we could build nanotubes from this pseudomonas protein in cystic fibrosis lungs. You know? And so he's at the molecular foundry pursuing that. So basically, the bottom line is this. Here's a scientist who was trained in an environment where he was exposed to concepts of nanoscience. He's post in a bacterial pathogenesis lab, but he kind of put two and two together, right? So I think starting now, if we train people to cross disciplines like that, then we'll see more people from a biological background come into a nanoscience institute and, and do nano research, you know, using molecular biology as a building tool. But it's... And I think there's an opportunity, you know, for the students and postdocs in the audience. This is a big opportunity. So if you do have a background in biology, start thinking about what you can do in nanoscience. And if you are a nanoscientist, go spend some time in a biology lab. Learn how to make proteins using DNA, you know, and see where that takes you. You'll get a job, I guarantee you. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering whether um, the solution was an overkill for the original problem. Um, Obviously, if you put mucin on the carbon nanotubes, it's going to be compatible. But the question is, can you put something much simpler uh, in chemical terms that is also biocompatible and so uh, more suitable for the inorganic chemists who want to do the minimum amount with their car carbon nanotubes? Um, there's definitely coatings. We haven't explored these, but other labs have recently published on them. There are, there are other polymers that you can coat nanotubes with to prevent them from killing cells in culture. 
But if you want them to interact with cells in a specific way, then you do have to engineer some ligand onto the tube that can bind a receptor that's on the protein, as, that's on the cell, rather. So, but yeah, for the simplest, I just want to have cell, you know, carbon nanotubes be non-toxic. There are some polymers, you know, that have been reported to passivate. Not all will passivate. And right now it's kind of empirical. You know, why some do and some don't, I don't know. But yeah. Next question. Yeah, my question is, uh, Oops. it's related to this uh, toxicity of this nanotube. I wonder, do you, know, do you have some kind of conclusive or some kind of uh, answer to what's the reason? Or is a polymer, any polymer is it toxic to the, to the uh, cell or something? Yeah, so, so why, when we coat these tubes with mucins, do they now become non-toxic? We don't know, and we're working on that. Like, what's the actual mechanism of the toxicity in the first place, and why did this, this polymer passivate? Not all polymer coatings will passivate, okay? Some do and some don't. There's one I know that does that's published, other than ours, and it's kind of random, you know? And then there are others that, that don't, and I don't know why. And again, not knowing the mechanism, it's hard to you know, explain those empirical observations, but we're hoping to get some more cell biological detail in the system, which includes things like, you know, when you incubate, there's lots of ways cells can die, turns out. Death is a complicated process in biology. And one of the first questions we're asking is, how do these cells die when they're in the presence of the nanotubes? Do they undergo a programmed cell death, for example, which is one pathway of death? So start, we start there. And do we have any more questions? To, uh, can you micropipette HeLa cells? Microinject? Micro-inject. Um, HeLa cells are not bad for microinjection because they're pretty big, but Jercat cells are bad for microinjection because they're just really small. So the bigger the cell, the easier it is to microinject. And if it has a really thick shell, like an oocyte, then that's the best of all. Okay, so big, robust, tough cells are, are, are the best for microinjection, and little, wimpy little cells are not as good, and bacterial cells, which are really small, they themselves are on the scale of one to two microns in diameter. They're impossible to micro-inject. So that's our next big challenge is can we nano-inject a bacterial cell? And this is something that, you know, there's no equivalent of that out there right now. Okay, and we got time for one more question. Back to the micro-injection, I was wondering how long does that actually take for the reduction of the disulfide bond, and um, do you want to and can you control the number of quantum dots that you inject? Good questions. So first of all, how long does it take to reduce that disulfide bond? Um, in practice, in our hands, it's like, you know, if you hold the, tube, the uh, nanotube inside the cell for about 15 minutes, you'll release between like 12 and 25 quantum dots, okay? If you hold it in there for a few lesser time, you release fewer. And more time, release greater, OK? Um, that's, in our mind, a limitation of the technique as it's now designed. Because you know, there might be applications where you want to release not between 12 and 20, but n, you know, 5 or 1 or 12 or 100. And you don't want to wait 15 minutes to do it. You'd like to do it instantaneously for a higher temporal resolution experiment. So, one of the directions we're working on now, and this is in the hands of a postdoc who I think is in the audience. Did I see Ramesh? It's in, there he is. Um, what he's developing is an electrochemically cleavable linker that basically one could instantaneously release through passing an electrical current. And this is where the problem of selecting not just any old nanotube to put on the AFM tip, but a semiconducting nanotube is very important. So, you know, we have to work on that, and then we're working on a molecule that we can basically cleave by just hitting a button that passes an electrical pulse down the AFM tip through the carbon nanotube. We can exploit its conducting properties in that way. That's the hope. Well, uh, let's give Professor Rotze a round of applause. Oh, thank you. We have refreshments outside as well. <laughs>